The ancient Sumerian tablets describe the stories of the gods, their adventures, deeds, and battles leading to the creation of the heavens, the earth, and humanity. Many of these stories are interpreted to be describing planets and the formation of the early solar system. And in many ways, the theories appear to add up. However, as the tablet stories continue on, they are read in a different way, as if these gods were not deities at all, but physical beings who came to the earth and were involved in human history. When we're looking into the stories and interpretations of the Sumerian tablets, there comes a point when we have to change our perspective as to the nature of who or what these gods were. For so long now, we've been observing the interpretations where these deities are essentially a storytelling method to explain the creation of our solar system in the form of planets. The electric universe and the Nibiru theory covers a few different possibilities about how these events could have transpired. However, as we look to the continuation of these stories, we begin to see the interpretations change. Looking at the Enuma Elish and a wide number of other Sumerian tablet stories, we see these gods interpreted as if they were actual physical beings who were believed to have played a part in the creation of humanity. This is one of the many reasons that interpreting the tablets are strange and why historians may often choose to perceive the entire thing as a series of metaphors instead. In the main interpretation that came from Sitchin, he believed that these beings came from the planet Nibiru. However, other scholars who also interpret these gods as beings sometimes forego the conversation of Nibiru entirely and suggest instead that they simply came from somewhere else, such as the Pleiades, which are written about quite commonly in the tablets. Keep this in mind as we move forward, because while we'll be focusing on the general interpretations here, there are tons of variations and ideas about how this could have played out. Going back to the Enuma Elish, it ends with Enki or Ea creating humanity because Marduk commissioned it so. In other Sumerian stories, we find a similar description, except it is Enlil in the place of Marduk, because Marduk replaced Enlil in the Babylonian version. Enlil and Marduk are very similar though. They are both considered the supreme leaders of the Anunnaki. The only main difference is that Marduk is Enki's son and Enlil is Enki's half brother. But herein we find perhaps one of the biggest criticisms of Sitchin's work. Sometimes Ea or Enki appears as a planet and other times he seems to be a flesh and blood deity. It can be very confusing, and it's up to all of us to explore the possibilities. Now, I suppose it doesn't really matter if we're looking at the entire story as an allegory, but observing it as actual historical events can definitely cause confusion in this regard. So for the sake of telling the story, we'll be using the name Ea to express the planet and Enki to describe the physical being. Just be aware that if you look these up online, you will find many places where their names overlap with each other in the mythologies. To that end, most of the deities you'll find have multiple names anyways. Enki is also known as Enkig, Nidimud, and Ninsiku throughout the various tellings. And as we previously described, he was the god of water, mischief, crafts, wisdom, and creation. Enlil, his brother on the other hand, was known as Elil and Nunamnir, and he was the Sumerian god of the air and was more powerful than any other elemental deity, eventually being worshiped as the king of the gods. He was also the son of Anu, and together, the three of them formed a triad which governed the heavens, earth, and underworld, or alternatively, the universe, sky and atmosphere, and the earth itself. After Anu, Enlil was the most powerful of the Mesopotamian gods, keeper of the Tablet of Destinies, which contained the fates of both gods and humans. But in that case, who was Anu? And what were the Anunnaki? That's a great question, but before we can answer it, we're going to have to look at another question first. So let's do the time warp again and return to that burning question from so long ago, who are the Nephilim?
As we've discussed, the Bible speaks of these people or beings called the Nephilim. There's a lot of debate today as to who and what these beings were. Looking back to the original Hebrew translation, we see the word Nephilim directly translates to the fallen ones. Today, many believe this to mean that they were fallen angels, which seems to be what was depicted in the 2014 film, Noah. Sitchin, on the other hand, believed the translation was a bit different. He read fallen ones to mean those who came down and that they didn't fall, but landed here in some kind of spaceship. To him, the Nephilim were the people of the fiery rockets. Of course, this is one of those translations that doesn't seem to often hold up well to scrutiny, but it's interesting given the context of these stories nonetheless. We should note that in his writings, Sitchin commonly used the name Nephilim in tandem with the Anunnaki, also written sometimes as Anuna. But personally, I'm not certain that this is the best use of these titles. You see, the Anunnaki are believed to have been the descendants of Anu, the Sky Father, and the two most prominent leaders of this group are Enki and Enlil. Beyond that, there's a lot of inconsistency between how many Anunnaki there were and what roles they fulfilled. For example, in the Enuma Elish, there's only a small handful of gods who are introduced. Tiamat, Enki, Marduk, you know the group. But then out of nowhere, Marduk places 600 gods on the earth and 300 in the heavens. And no explanation is ever given about who these gods were or where they came from. Later on in our own history, the ancient Hittites identified the Anunnaki as the oldest generation of gods who were overthrown and banished to the underworld by the younger gods, which is curiously what is described in the Enuma Elish itself and reflects the stories of the old Titan gods in Greece being overthrown by a younger pantheon. In the Bible, we see the following passage. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Well, they better have been courtly and romantic because if that line is implying anything else, I don't like it. The Bible describes that they were the offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of men, essentially making the Nephilim be a little bit more like demigods, a hybridized species born of the gods who would have been the Anunnaki and humans together. It's theorized this could be where demigods in general came from, such as Hercules, who is the son of the god Zeus and the mortal woman named Alchemini. The result of this made Hercules fully human yet who had the gift of the tremendous strength of a god. Of course, depending on who you're speaking with, the concept of Nephilim could just come from a mistranslation of the Bible and the Anunnaki being simply an ancient Mesopotamian archetype. For the sake of the story, I will be telling the tale from the perspective that the Anunnaki are physical beings. But as always, feel free to interpret this however you like, and please share your thoughts in the comments below as to what you believe these Anunnaki were. This story begins several hundred thousand years ago and starts in the midst of a drama involving the Anunnaki, the planet Nibiru, and our Earth. Sitchin wrote that he believed that the planet Nibiru was inhabited with life at one point in its history. He wrote that the dominant species on the planet were bipedal in stature and had evolved conscious minds. They were the Anunnaki. These beings were said to be much bigger than we are today, with the women being about 10 to 12 feet and the men being 14 to 16 feet tall which you might recall relates with the various levels of consciousness we explored way back in Spirit Science 11 and 12. The Anunnaki were not immortal, but they had exceptionally long lifetimes compared to what we we're used to. Sitchin's translations estimated their lifespan to be somewhere between 360,000 and 500,000 Earth years. However, another scholar, Lawrence Gardner, suggested the Anunnaki only had lifespans of 50,000 years. The Anunnaki have been described in several different ways. Most commonly, they're depicted as tall bearded men, and sometimes there are women and children depicted as well. However, they sometimes are interpreted to have been crocodile-like in nature or with reptilian features. If you're familiar with a lot of new age ideas, you might've heard of the idea of reptilians, which are said to be bipedal lizard creatures and are usually the antagonists in the human story. However, just as there are reptile humanoid statues from ancient Sumer, so too are the Anunnaki also depicted as bird-like, which Sitchin believed was simply their space helmets. Either way, both of these depictions of the Anunnaki as reptiles or birds are scarce with the tall bearded men version being the most prominent. I do believe that regardless of what these beings look like, it's the bearded image of these so-called deities that gave us our common Christian image today, God as an older gentleman with a long beard. To that end, even Sitchin fought the idea that the Anunnaki were reptilian beings. And this was because he wanted his theory to fit with the Bible. To him, the gods could not be in the form of the biblical serpent. 
Nevertheless, these different depictions have given rise to a lot of online debate about what these beings could look like, if they're even literal physical beings to begin with. Many proponents of the reptilian theory suggest that these beings are actually shapeshifters as well and can change their form at will, which is why there are different depictions of them throughout history. This adds an entirely new dimension to the discussion and gives rise to the popular conspiracy theory that they could even be living among us today in secret. At any rate, for the focus of this series, we're going to keep to the depiction of the Anunnaki as these bearded humanoids, and we'll come back around to the alternate depictions sometime later on. One of the most important Sumerian gods is the Sky Father named Anu. A number of Sumerian texts discuss Anu, but not all agree to every aspect of his existence, such as where he came from or what he actually is. Despite the fact that we previously observed Anu as Uranus, on an allegorical level, Anu could simply be the way that the Sumerians personified the sky. And therefore, the Anunnaki are those who came from the sky and outer space. The name Anu is the root word of Anunnaki, which is sometimes translated as offspring of Anu or princely offspring. This is why Sitchin believed that they were the species that came from above and beyond our planet. Anu was the heavenly father and those who descended from the sky were his children. Once again, we see descriptions of God today as passed down throughout history. In Christianity, God is called the heavenly father, the origins of which we find with Anu, the ancient Sumerian God of the sky. According to Sitchin's translations and theories on the subject, the Anunnaki were technologically advanced beings living on the planet Nibiru. Let me also be clear that in Sitchin's book, The Lost Book of Enki, he puts forth a potential version of this ancient past drama, which is really epic, but also very elaborate and long. Honestly, this book would make a great Hollywood movie, just saying. Actually, in a way, it kind of already has. And I just wanna take a moment to give a huge shout out to the band and team behind Messengers of the Wind, an animated rock opera that you can watch right now on YouTube. The whole thing is seriously amazing. And I just had to give it some mad props right here and now. As for today's exploration of this theory, we're just going to be going over the essentials. Otherwise, we could literally be here for a week. Sometime around 450,000 years ago, long after the event between Nibiru and the planet Tiamat, the Anunnaki began having a problem with their planet. As we discussed earlier, this planet had a very strange orbit, which took it far away from the sun for long periods of time. Sitchin interpreted from the tablets that the planet had a lot of internal heat, which kept things alive in the long distances of space. However, over time and with the cooling of the planet and potentially even the widening out of its rather sharp orbit, Nibiru grew colder and colder during its long voyages away from the sun and the planet was slowly becoming less habitable. Sitchin suggested that the Anunnaki scientists decided on a solution that would strengthen their atmosphere and hold heat in for significantly longer periods of time, making it possible to survive in the far reaches of space. The Anunnaki decided that they would gather large amounts of gold and pulverize it into a fine powder and release it into their atmosphere, essentially creating a heat container for their planet. Believe it or not, our scientists have considered the exact same thing, putting light reflecting particles into our stratosphere to help fix the ozone layer and cool our ever warming planet. And so in their attempt to solve their problem, they began looking for large quantities of gold in our solar system as their planet didn't have the large quantities they needed to coat an entire atmosphere with gold. The Anunnaki had the capacity of space travel, though Sitchin believed that at the time, they weren't much further advanced than we are right now, since they didn't seem to have the ability to travel to other solar systems in their search. They scanned all of the planets in our solar system until they found what they were looking for, large deposits of gold right here on Earth. As the story goes, when Nibiru first came into our solar system, the Anunnaki would deploy a team of workers to Earth's orbit with one singular purpose, to mine gold. In the process of doing this, they also established a way station on Mars, which would help in shuttling the gold back to Nibiru once it was mined. Sitchin also believed that they had, during this time, built the face on Mars as a monument to an Anunnaki who had died there after playing a pivotal role in finding the gold, which was going to save their planet. To lightly touch on the subject of the face on Mars, when you investigate this yourself, you'll find two prominent stories. One is the official response from NASA, which says that it's just a natural rock formation, which due to the way the light was hitting it at the time of the photograph, created this image of a face, but ultimately it's just an illusion. Generally, 
Those who question this perspective are often subject to ridicule. And so of course we have to go there. It wouldn't be spirit science if we didn't. On the other side of the spectrum, you'll find ex-NASA scientists and astronauts, retired US Army command sergeants, and a university physics professor, along with a number of ancient astronaut and conspiracy theorists who put forth that the face, along with a set of nearby mountainous structures that look an awful lot like pyramids, are the remnants of an ancient civilization. Now, please know that I fully understand this is a huge claim and one that we don't take lightly. So please allow me a moment to share with you what we've come up with while investigating this whole thing. In a lecture given in 2009, Bob Dean, a retired command sergeant major, said the following. Ladies and gentlemen, my government, NASA, N-A-S-A, which many of us in the United States say stands for never a straight answer. <laughs> proceeded to erase 40 rolls of film of the Apollo program. The flight to the moon, the flight around the moon, the landings on the moon, the walking guys here and there. They erased, for Christ's sake, 40 rolls of film of those events. Now we're talking about several thousand individual frames <coughs> that were taken that the so-called authorities security did not have a right to see. Oh, they were disruptive, uh, socially unacceptable, politically unacceptable. I, I become furious. I'm a retired command sergeant major. I was never famous for having a lot of patience. Now, another man named Brian O'Leary, who was a NASA astronaut and a close friend of Carl Sagan for many years, expressed in an interview with Project Camelot that a huge rift was created in their friendship over the face on Mars. Carl and I debated this, and it was very disappointing to me because not only was Carl wrong, he also fudged data. He, he, he published a, a, a picture of the face in Parade Magazine, a popular article saying that the face is just a natural formation, but he doctored the picture to make it not look like a face. And I began to realize just directly from a scientific point of view, not only hearsay, that this man was colluding with NASA, that there, there might be more to this than before. And then when I started studying things like MJ-12 and other organizations that were covering up the UFO phenomenon, Carl was on a committee with a number of notable people. There was a report issued by the Brookings Institution in 1961, and that's about when I knew Carl during those years, the 60s mostly, is when I worked closely with him, that he, he and this other group said, well, if any ETs ever showed up on the Earth, it has to be covered up. That's the only way we're going to be able to manage this, because if we can't, it would be too much of a culture shock. So their recommendation to the government in 1961 was to cover up the UFO phenomenon. And I think in a way that provided it a justification for the ongoing cover-up. Uh, way back in 61, was to keep things secret. But Bob and Brian aren't alone in their claims. We also find very accomplished scientists and mechanical engineers who were involved with NASA, who basically share the same story. We'll share some links in the author comments so that you can read up on all of these responses to Cydonia and the face on Mars. And with that, it's about time we return to our story. Now in the Enuma Elish, it says that Marduk placed 300 Anunnaki in the heavens and 600 on the earth or the netherworld, depending on the translation. And all of these Anunnaki were led by 12 leaders. Sitchin believed that this was attempting to describe that there were 600 worker Anunnaki who came to earth to dig the gold, who were led by 12 supervisors or bosses. The 300 gods in the heavens were believed to be another 300 Anunnaki who stayed in orbit on their mothership above the surface of the planet, similar to how we have the International Space Station in orbit today. To begin their mission, the Anunnaki first went to the Middle East, Sitchin believed it to be in the area of present-day Iraq, where in seven days they established Eridu. Eridu is commonly believed to be the oldest Sumerian site across all of Mesopotamia. And is it possible that this is where the seven days of creation come from in Genesis? Either way, it was here that they established their headquarters. For the gold, however, they went to mine a specific valley in Southeast Africa, where the largest natural deposit of gold was known to be. Of the 12 supervisors, Enlil was the leader of the whole operation, and Enki was second in command. The Anunnaki carved deep into the earth, 
and dug large quantities of gold. Then every 3,600 years when planet Nibiru came around, they would shuttle the gold to their homeworld and return to digging while Nibiru traveled its orbit again. Now, according to Sitchin and supporting theorists, they dug for a very long time, about 100,000 to 150,000 years before the rebellion took place. Somewhere between 300,000 and 200,000 years ago, the Anunnaki workers rebelled against their bosses. They did not want to keep digging in the mines. One can easily imagine them saying, we've been digging gold for 150,000 years and we're tired of it, we're done. The rebellion presented a problem for the supervisors and something had to be done. This is where Enlil and Enki come into the story in a very prominent way. If you recall in the original Sumerian story, we had two versions of the conception of humans. In one, it was Namu's idea. And in the other, Enlil told Namu the idea who gave it to Enki. So as our story goes, during the time of the rebellion, Enki's mother communicated with Enki while he slept, sending him a vision saying, "'Oh, my son, arise from thy bed, from thy slumber. Work what is wise, fashion servants for the gods.'" Due to the variations, it's not clear about where the true origins of this vision come from. But nevertheless, Enki awakens from this vision-filled slumber and suggests creation of servants for the gods. According to the story, Enki himself creates human beings out of a mixture of clay and the blood of the slain Kingu. This is another time where we have two different interpretations converging on each other, because earlier we saw how Kingu was interpreted to be the moon, but now Kingu seems to be a being with flesh and blood, for it is with Kingu's DNA that provides the necessary ingredients for human genetics. What is Kingu, really? Looking at the rest of this description, we see a few more possible interpretations. To some, the term clay doesn't mean like physical clay, but earthly matter, including pre-existing life. And many believe that this line actually means that humans were created in a synthesis of Anunnaki DNA and the DNA of the highest form of primitive life available on the earth. This then would suggest that humans weren't necessarily created, but came from a modification of an earlier hominid species, which was most likely either Homo erectus or Homo heidelbergensis. For years, we've been struggling to find the missing link between our species, Homo sapiens, and our predecessors. And this search is still taking place today. Perhaps this is our missing link. What's especially interesting about this is the timeline, because we currently understand that Homo sapiens emerged roughly two to 300,000 years ago, which is said to be right about when the Anunnaki rebellion took place. Throughout the tablets, genetics and the transformation of the human being are recurring themes, in the Flower of Life books, which originally put a lot of different pieces together in these stories, Drumfalo puts forth another piece of information that is very intriguing. He describes that in order to create a new species, you need both a father species and a mother species. Just like in order to create a child, you need a mother and a father. Drumfalo said that the Anunnaki were our mother species because they did the actual birthing and that our father species were actually the Syrians, or at least a species from the star system Sirius. So to be very clear, these beings came from Sirius, not Syria, which is one of the closest stars to us and the brightest star in the sky. Well, not counting the sun. Okay, second brightest. Now, while the Anunnaki were primarily a third dimensional species, the Syrians were fourth dimensional. And so were able to come to our planet in a way that was probably like tessering from a wrinkle in time. In a stunning ritual, he described that these beings traveled here interdimensionally and entered directly into the womb of the halls of Amenti and before the flower of life the sacred heart of all consciousness on the planet. Because they understood everything was light and energy, in their fourth dimension, they created 32 rose quartz slabs and then laid down upon them and entered into a long meditation, conceiving a new consciousness. Then Enki on the third dimension created a laboratory human egg, a genetic fusion of Anunnaki DNA and the DNA of the previous hominid species and put them into Anunnaki women who were volunteering to do this. The new seeds of consciousness created by the Syrians then entered into the eggs and impregnated the women who nurtured them for what probably felt like nine months or so and bore them as children. Now, let's be clear that this part about the Syrians is not found in the Sumerian tablets themselves. And so it's not grounded in any ancient writing, but it's a very compelling idea nonetheless, especially because of its implications that the Anunnaki developed our bodies, but not our souls. And I mean, who knows? Maybe they were the bird people. Then again, it might all just be a fun idea and nothing more, because just as much as the Syrians could be said to be our father species, it could also be said that Homo erectus was our father species, 
the seed that was nurtured into something new. Ultimately, after all was said and done, the tablets write that the Anunnaki had created an entirely new species of life on planet Earth. And that species was us. The legends in the ancient tablets are very clear that the Anunnaki created humans to support and serve the gods and help maintain all of creation. A lot of questions still remain though. What happened once we were created and how did we earn our freedom? The plan for the Anunnaki was to create a more advanced race than Earth had at the time to use for the purpose of mining gold and performing other laborious tasks. This, according to these interpretations of the ancient Sumerian records, was our original purpose as a species, a slave race to mine gold. Sitchin believed that the Anunnaki's original intention was to use us to mine all of the gold that they needed and then destroy our race and leave the planet once they had no more use for us. What's amazing about this interpretation is that there are some incredible discoveries we've made in recent years that lend some merit to the story. As we previously discussed, we have first the timeline itself. The sudden emergence of Homo sapiens two to 300,000 years ago is a huge piece in the puzzle. What caused this dramatic jump in evolution from Homo erectus or Homo heidelbergensis at this time frame? Today, archeologists still have a difficult time explaining it. I don't want to outright suggest that it was explicitly the Anunnaki, Maybe it was a big cosmic monolith from 2001, a space odyssey. That'd be pretty cool. Then again, the tablets say it was Enki. So let's go with that for now. Now, here's where we have something very curious. And if you haven't heard it before, brace yourself because it's pretty amazing. Right in the area where the Sumerian records state that we mined gold, archeologists have found what may actually be gold mines. And these ancient ruins are believed by some to date back as far as 200,000 years. Stay open while we go through this because there's a lot of mystery here and even more debate around the nature of these ruins. So we'll do our best to cover all sides of the argument. Archeologists, anthropologists, and historians don't really have an answer about how these colossal sites could exist back from 200,000 years ago, which is why many still debate that they're only 25,000 years old or somewhere between those numbers. The general consensus in the mainstream world is that they're just early human settlements, not gold mines. However, even if this is true, even if these sites are not ancient gold mines, the magnitude of these ruins, even dating them at their most recent date, throws a huge wrench in our modern preconceptions about the origins of agriculture and civilization, with historian Professor Peter Delius and archeologist Dr. Alex Schumann putting forth that they are a clear indication of an ancient technological and agricultural innovation long before the colonial era. Along with these amazing insights, we also have the discovery of what is now called Adam's calendar, which is a curious arrangement of ancient blocks aligned perfectly with the movements of the sun, solstices, and equinoxes. Today, these sites are known as the Bocconi ruins, named after the Bocconi people who trace back to the early 16th century, despite clear evidence that these ruins date back thousands upon thousands of years prior. The ruins themselves today are generally neglected by the government and heritage institutions and are getting damaged over time, but some have been saved thanks to the initiatives of private owners. These ruins are a giant complex of circular structures connected by channels and suspended in an expansive web of agricultural terraces. If we assume these were dwellings, some suggest it could have held an absolutely massive population, which is unimaginable to think something like this could exist so long ago. But now here's where things get even more interesting. Extensive electronic measurements that took place of these ruins in 2011 have shown that the circular stone ruins are actually energy generating devices using the natural sounds that emanate from the earth to create strong electromagnetic fields as a result of sound amplification. The shapes of these circular ruins are specific and unique because each circle represents the cymatic pattern of the sound energy as it appears on the surface of the earth at that point. And just briefly, in case you're unfamiliar with it, Cymatics is a word derived from the Greek kaima, meaning wave, and takaimatica, meaning matters pertaining to waves. The study of cymatics was pioneered by a Swiss medical doctor and natural scientist named Hans Jenny. He was able to create a physical representation of vibration or how sound manifests into form through the medium of various materials. This fascinating work offers profound insights into both the physical sciences and esoteric philosophies and illustrates the very principles which inspired the ancient Greek philosophers. These cymatic images are truly awe-inspiring, not only for their visual beauty in portraying the inherent responsiveness of matter to sound, 
but also because they inspire a deep recognition that we too are intrinsically connected to the same complex vibrational matrix of reality. As we explored way back in Spirit Science 7, the particles that make up the entire universe move in these very same geometric wave-like patterns. So we can see that at every level of reality, the essence of cymatics is present. Now, let us pretend that these really are ancient gold mines, as many people today believe they are. It would appear then that with a deep understanding of the phenomenon of cymatics, that the Anunnaki were able to mine gold or perhaps move it around using the frequencies of the earth. And thus their gold mines were designed very specifically to resonate with the sounds of the planet, allowing them to do their work more easily. We know today that sound levitation is fully a thing and may even be a great key to flying vehicles one day. So is it possible that these sites are the ancient remnant of sound levitation and like uses on an absolutely massive scale? Some sites such as this one are even more unique, having seemed to be constructed to very precise phi ratios. I know that so far we've been drawing all of these miners with pickaxes and we're going to continue to, but please know that this is for the ease of telling the story for us today. To these ancient miners, they'd probably think pickaxes were a fairly limited and primitive technology. Regarding these ruins, the man responsible for leading the research on the electromagnetic fields of these sites is Michael Tellinger, who wrote the following about his experience there. I have measured these spectacular energies and electromagnetic waves and therefore do not hesitate to make these claims. The fact that these circles are all connected by the stone channels makes it very clear to any scientist who works with electricity or energy that the stone circle complex is a giant energy generating grid that was most likely used in the mining and processing of gold on a scale unimaginable to us today. From Michael's work, he suggests that there was a civilization living at the tip of South Africa, mining gold for nearly 200,000 years, a civilization which at some point completely and suddenly vanished from the radar. Now, for those of us today who don't believe these stories are true, we must ask the question, what in the blazes were ancient primitive humans doing with all of that gold? What did we use it for? Keep in mind, the general consensus is that at this stage in human evolution, we were purely hunter gatherers. It was not until after 9,500 BCE that the eight so-called founder crops of agriculture appear. And these ruins are dated significantly older than this. We know today that gold is a very soft metal and not really something that we could use like other metals, certainly not if we were so primitive as most of the world's historians agree that we were. Critics often put forth against Michael Tellinger and his claims that these sites could not possibly be gold mines because there is no ancient artifact that we know of today made of gold that exists before 4,600 BCE. Then again, if the Anunnaki were shipping the gold off to their planet or wherever, it would make sense that humans wouldn't be crafting things out of it anyways. It is most certainly an extremely unique puzzle made even more amazing by the fact that Sitchin wrote the Anunnaki were mining gold in Southeast Africa way back in 1976, long before the discovery of these sites truly came to light. For all of the people who claim that Sitchin didn't even know how to read the tablets and all of his interpretations are wrong, I pose the question, how is this even possible? Now, I know what you might be thinking. Michael Tellinger read a Sitchin book, went to Africa, and then claimed some old ruins that he found were gold mines. And you know what? Maybe he really was looking for them. However, if we consider that he is correct and that the energetic and cymatic readings of the site truly do indicate that they were gold mines, then it really does call us to reevaluate everything we think we know about human origins. The back and forth between historians and archeologists on this, and even naming the ruins after the Bakoni people reminds me of exactly the same thing that happened around the age of the Sphinx. Today, Egyptologists stand definitively behind the idea that the Sphinx was built around 2500 BC by the Pharaoh Khafre, despite significant archeological evidence, such as the weathering patterns on the Sphinx, that prove it is significantly older, at least 12,000, if not 35,000 years old. The way that skeptics treat Sitchin and his work, you'd think he was just throwing darts at a map and wherever they landed was wherever he pegged the story to take place. But if those ruins truly are the remnants of gold mines, then we have to ask the question, was Sitchin actually able to read the tablets better than everyone else in recent history? Today, most historians believe that the Sumerian tablets don't speak of gold mines at all, and that Sitchin essentially just made it all up. In the 12th planet, Sitchin explains his reasoning, which actually has to do with Apsu, also written as Abzu. If you recall, Apsu is regarded as the aquifers under Mesopotamia, 
and Sitchin translated him to actually mean the sun. But after Enki took the throne, Apsu became a location rather than a deity. Sitchin writes, the Sumerian term Abzu, which scholars have accepted to mean watery deep, requires a fresh and critical analysis. Literally, the term meant primeval deep source, not necessarily of waters. According to Sumerian grammatical rules, either of two syllables of any term could precede the other without changing the word's meaning, with the result that Abzu and Zuab meant the same thing. The latter spelling of the Sumerian term enables identification of its parallel in the Semitic languages, for Za'ab has always meant and still means precious metal, specifically gold in Hebrew and its sister languages. The Sumerian pictograph for Abzu was that of an excavation deep into the earth mounted by a shaft. Thus, Ea was not the lord of an indefinite watery deep, but the god in charge of the exploitation of earth's minerals. This is a very curious correlation, considering that gold is often called the royal metal sacred in ancient times and is the metal most commonly associated with the sun in ancient alchemy and very often related with solar deities. So we see Apsu firstly written as the sun and then a physical metal commonly identified as the metal of the sun and sun gods. Wowzy, but you know what? Our discoveries don't end there. Let's now shift the conversation for a moment to explore one more curious relationship between what we know today about human history and the story from these tablets there is a colloquial mitochondrial Eve theory that scientists first presented in the early 1980s. By 1987, a publication by scientists Kahn, Stone King, and Wilson revealed that the matrilineal source of our common DNA lineage dates back between 140 and 200,000 years ago. To be clear, the original nomenclature for this finding was lucky mother. But when a publication in science titled The Unmasking of Mitochondrial Eve was released to the world, the name Eve stuck in the minds of the masses. Just to make sure there's an understanding of these results, they refer to a common matrilineal mitochondrial line, a common root for all humans. What's so interesting here and why this research has relevance to this part of the story is that the first collective person happened to come from the same exact time frame and valley that humans were mining gold in. The latest research on this from 2013 serves only to create an even more robust data set to support the original date and region of mitochondrial Eve. Isn't it so remarkable that the original theory and still prevalent out of Africa theory of human origin just so happens to point to the same valley where the Sumerian records say that it all started? Coincidence? You decide. Let's now bring ourselves back to the story sometime around two to 300,000 years ago when Enki created humanity. If you are knowledgeable of Greek mythology, this part of the story sounds very familiar to Prometheus, the ancient Titan who created humanity out of clay. Like Prometheus, Enki stands up for the human race when in conflict with the gods, most of all, Enlil. From a more scientific perspective, the tablets seem to depict Enki as a geneticist who used some form of advanced technology to clone and create this new kind of human. There's even tablet images that depict a pattern that looks an awful lot like a DNA strand. Despite Enki's work, Enlil was still in charge of the operation and would command Enki to modify the genome as he required. Sitchin explains that the combination of earthly clay mixed with divine blood to create the prototype of man is firmly established by the Mesopotamian texts. We also see this reflected in Genesis 2, where Elohim fashioned Adam from the clay of the soil and he blew in his nostrils the breath of life and Adam turned into a living being with a soul. The Hebrew term commonly translated as soul here is nefesh, that elusive spirit that animates a body and seemingly abandons it when the physical form dies. Interestingly, the term Adama, after which the name Adam was coined, originally meant not just any earth or soil, but specifically dark red soil. The Hebrew name for the color red is also Adam, which stems from the word for blood. This name Adam employed a Sumerian linguistic play of double meanings. The Adam could mean several things, one of the earth, one made of dark red soil, and especially the one made of blood. The Sumerian texts also speak of attempts to craft a perfect primitive worker, which along the way resulted in deformed humans created by Enki and the mother goddess Ninhursag, which you might remember from her other name in the Babylonian story, Damkina. Essentially, in an attempt to perfectly match the genome of their human prototypes with the Anunnaki, 
there were some mistakes that were made along the way through a process of trial and error. Ninhursag also has another name called Ninma. And in one particular ancient story called Ankia Ninma describes a bunch of awkward failures. In the story, Ninma produces a man who could not bend his outstretched weak hands, one who could not close his eyes, one with both feet broken, one who was just an idiot, a man who could not hold back his urine, a woman who could not bear children, and a being who had no sex organs at all. With each new failed attempt at a proper functioning human, Anki finds a place for them in society, often as servants for the king. Sitchin theorized that the story recalls the first phase of the existence of the hybrid man, a being in likeness and image of the gods, but incomplete in some ways, including sexually, lacking in quote unquote, knowing. However, they were still useful to the Anunnaki's plan as servants in some way, shape and form. According to this theory, for many thousands of years, Anki continually cloned and created new proto-humans who would grow up to become miners. However, these beings were sterile. They could not reproduce. During the period in which they grew into adults, these first humans were placed in an area where they could be contained and not leave. Sitchin believed that it was only when they grew up enough to be useful to the Anunnaki that they were transported to the mining area in Africa. I will also fully acknowledge that there's some discrepancy in this idea though, because the story of Anki and Ninma specifically says, Ninma took clay from the top of the Abzu in her hand and she fashioned from it first a man who could not bend his outstretched weak hands. The use of the location Abzu here though, suggests that the creation of humanity actually took place in Africa, which also aligns better with the mitochondrial Eve discovery that we looked at earlier. Perhaps then it's just the other way around and that after fashioning these servants, they were found useful to the Anunnaki in other ways than mining and were transported to Mesopotamia to help work in and maintain Eridu or other locations nearby. Either way, it's believed that the location where these slaves worked in Mesopotamia was a place called Eden, which is the root word for the biblical garden of Eden. There's a few ideas about this translation though. Today, most modern scholars translate the Sumerian term Eden as step or plain, suggesting it refers to a large field, I guess. Sitchin, on the other hand, translated Eden to mean home or abode of the righteous ones. At any rate, it's what happened in this location where things get intense. A dispute was growing betwixt the gods. You see, Enlil is often described as the oppressor of humanity, a bit of a patriarchal overlord who commanded the slaves. Enlil is said not to really care about humanity though. He just wants to mine gold, destroy humanity and go home. The tablets even say that he orchestrates a massive flood to wipe out humanity, a subject that we'll get to shortly. Anki, on the other hand, is described as humanity's champion. Anki cares about humanity and sees them a bit like his children. And while they've been producing all of these sterile slave humans to mine gold and till the fields and all that stuff, in secret, he has been continually refining and developing the human genome to produce the perfect human, one who is capable of reproduction and living as its own sovereign species. This story says that Enki finally discovers the perfect genetic pairing and that a real human is achieved. On the subject of the creation of the first humans and this land of Eden, there are two Sumerian myths I'd love to share with you. The first being Enki and Ninhursag and the second being the Atrahasis. Now, the story of Enki and Ninhursag is a bit long. So we're just gonna summarize the essence of it here. Basically in the story, there is a paradise land called Dilmun. The story begins with what you might call not safe for work content. So I'm just gonna gloss over that for now and say that eventually Enki eats eight unique plants in this sacred paradise land. Unfortunately, the goddess Ninhursag considers this act to be a terrible sin. In a way, these are a bit like forbidden plants. And so she causes eight of Enki's body parts, including one of his ribs to suffer. Soon he is on the brink of death. Anlil, along with a magical talking fox who I'm imagining was just adorable, takes up Enki's cause and persuades Ninhursag to relent. Ninhursag returns to Enki and asks him eight times, my brother, what part of you hurts you? And he responds with the various parts of his body that hurts. As Ninhursag heals his body, eight different deities emerge in the healing process. And the one who emerges in the healing of his rib is the goddess Ninti, whose name means both lady of the rib and lady who makes life. As you can tell, there are tremendous parallels to this story of Eve being created from Adam's rib in Genesis 2, 
as this is its likely origin. Further, Eve in Hebrew is Hawa and is most commonly believed to mean living one or source of life. What I find especially interesting about this is that in the Sumerian story, the characters on who Adam and Eve are based on are both deities. While the name Adam comes from Adamu, the character seems to be based on Enki and Eve's name relating to life and being born of Adam's rib fully links her with Ninti. Now, the second story I mentioned, the Atra Hasis, essentially begins as the Enuma Elish ends with the need for servants for the gods. Instead of Kingu, however, an Anunnaki named Wei Lu, also Lawela, volunteers to be killed for the use of his blood. And his flesh, blood, and intelligence are kneaded into clay by the mother goddess, Ninhursag. With this mixture, she creates seven male and seven female human beings all at the same time. These 14 new creatures are exceptionally fertile, and soon there are hundreds and then thousands of people on the earth all doing the work which once occupied the Anunnaki workers. The story goes on to say that the humans grow very noisy and even obnoxious and disturb Enlil to the point that he decides to destroy them all. Huh, didn't Apsu and Tiamat have the same challenge with their kids? I guess history truly is doomed to repeat itself unless we can learn from our past mistakes. Anyways, the significant part of this story is that it says that they produced the men and women at the same time. It's important to note this because for thousands of years, we've been taught by the religious institutions of the world that the man came first. And that seems to pervade through our patriarchal society in a rather uncomfortable way. I hope that today, as we become more aware of these older stories, we might come to have a deeper understanding within us that we truly are all equal and the patriarchy can fade away into a society that respects and honors all sexes equally. Returning to the main story, we saw Anki and Ninhursag have been toying with the genetics until they could create a perfect being, one who could reproduce and think for themselves. The moment they did, it marked a huge turning point for everything because the success of this experiment changes the human genome to enlighten mankind. But as mentioned before, this was the beginning of a huge problem because Enlil did not want humanity to become a sovereign species of their own. He had plans to make little robot people to work for him and then he was gonna just outright destroy them all. When he found out what Enki had done, he was furious and exiled the humans from the Anunnaki settlements. Now, as a side tangent, here's something I think you're really going to enjoy. In the first episode of Ancient Civilizations on Gaia, Greg Braden explained something that is positively mind-blowing, a very relevant discovery found within our own DNA to give us a significantly different perspective of the Garden of Eden story and our origins. Now, at this time, I have to encourage you to really, really practice looking at this openly without judgment or fear, because there are deep, deep roots within our psyche from generations of institutional Judaism and Christianity that have essentially indoctrinated us into believing a very specific ideology. For example, the serpent in the Garden of Eden is said to be Satan. Generally, if you suggest an alternate interpretation to this, people naturally assume you must be evil yourself. So with that as a disclaimer, we get to see that the myths on which the Garden of Eden story were based actually suggests that the character who eventually was written to be the snake was really freeing us from our captivity. It was due to Enki's modification that we tasted a form of knowledge that we were not previously capable of comprehending, thinking for ourselves, becoming self-aware and capable of doing anything because we were no longer running on the Anunnaki programs, but our own unique consciousness. However, this also came at a price. We were capable of doing anything, including experiencing within us both good and evil. We had tasted from the fruit of knowledge of good and evil. Perhaps this is why the snake was written to be Satan in the creation of the Old Testament, because they had stories of paradise and gods from their ancient history, and the authors naturally assumed that the exile from the Garden of Eden was a punishment. In a way, it was, because we had to learn to fend for ourselves from now on. But ultimately, that would bring us to, over the next thousands of years, evolve our consciousness higher and higher and become the beings that we are today. The beautiful thing is, we are still growing. And one day, we will evolve to the point where we will know and understand that we are all connected and we will travel and explore the universe and experience a life almost unimaginable to us today. Now, there's one more fun thing about all of this that I wish to share with you. 
Genesis 3, 8 says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Okay, let's break this down. First, God is walking through the garden. He's walking, implying he has a physical body. In this classic scene, God is walking through the garden calling for Adam and Eve. He doesn't know where they are. He's God, but he doesn't know where Adam and Eve are? He calls for them and they come. He doesn't know that they ate the fruit until he sees them trying to hide themselves because they are ashamed. It is only then that he realizes what they've done. Now, is it just me or is it a little curious that a being considered an omnipotent creator deity would both have a body, misplace his creations, and then not know what they've been up to while he was out? On top of that, the name used for God in the original Hebrew Bible is Elohim. And this is a word which is not actually singular, but plural. It gives support to the idea that the God the Bible is describing was not a singular being, but a race of beings, or at least multiple physical beings. And as we saw earlier, when Enlil found out what Enki had done, he was furious. But regardless of what Enlil had commanded, human beings were created, and this set them on a path. Humanity stepped into a new beginning, free of slavery and into a journey of self-discovery. What's more amazing is that all of this was inscribed in the Sumerian tablets over 2000 years before the Bible was ever written down. When discussing the story of the history of humanity, this is the part where there's a bit of a break in the chain, making it very difficult to discern the truth. Keep this in mind for this chapter specifically, because the ancient accounts are very fragmented and their meanings are not always agreed upon. You see, most stories in the Sumerian tablets document the creation of humanity and then usually are fragmented until the story of the flood. The flood is a huge discussion of its own and one that we're going to be exploring very soon. However, there is a big mystery of what happened in the middle. In order to make sense of it, we have to look to a few different sources. It's definitely one of those subjects that I really encourage keeping an open mind about because there are several different key versions and stories about what happened, from James Churchward's account of Mu, to the Book of Enoch, to Plato's account of Atlantis, which may have even come from ancient Egypt. Along with that, we will also touch upon the Emerald Tablets of Thoth and other myths and legends from around the world. And of course, Drumvalo's account from his books, The Ancient Secret of the Flower of Life, which as we mentioned before, did an amazing job of putting a complete story together only a few decades ago. According to Drumvalo's version, from the time of Adam and Eve, our race developed in two strains, one that could live free from enslavement, although they were still monitored, and the others that were destined for a life of slavery. After the first humans were born, they moved away from Eden to another part of Africa or Eurasia, where they were allowed to grow and develop their consciousness. Eventually, there was a consciousness shift, and these early humans migrated to a place that was very isolated from the rest of the world. The place that we moved to was called Mu, though commonly today, it's known by the name Lemuria. When you begin to research Lemuria, you find some interesting things. The original theory for Lemuria was that it actually was an island or a stretch of islands located in the Indian Ocean, connecting Madagascar to India. The name Lemuria actually came about from a 19th century controversy over Darwin's origin of species. Defenders of his theory had trouble explaining how a certain species, specifically lemurs, became distributed in Madagascar and India but not in Africa or the Middle East, connecting the land masses. It became suggested that at one point, a land bridge existed in the Indian Ocean, which they named after the lemurs they were studying. Thus the name Lemuria came to be. The concept of Lemuria was quite popular for a while before losing relevance due to the evolution of continental drift theory, where the continents existed together as Pangaea. The name Lemuria was then later applied in modern spiritual circles to the legends of Mu, which is sometimes also called Pacifica. Anyway, so what is Mu? Well, the legend of Mu first began in the writings of Augustus Le Plongion, after his investigations of the Mayan ruins in the Yucatan. His work with translating parts of the Popol Vuh led him to believe that Mu was associated with the lost continent of Atlantis and wrote about it as such. However, Mu as a lost continent in the Pacific 
began with a man named James Churchward, who met with Plongion and his wife in 1885 after their 12 year excursion in the Yucatan. The hypotheses are featured in a series of books written by Churchward between 1926 and 1933. He claimed that when he was a young man serving as a soldier in India, a high ranking temple priest showed him an ancient set of clay tablets that only two others could read. James said that he convinced the priest to teach him the ancient language and that upon reading them, he learned that they came from a place where man first appeared, Mu. James gave a vivid account of an ancient advanced civilization, the Nikals, who flourished sometime between 50,000 and 12,000 years ago. Mu was said to have 64 million inhabitants and seven major cities with colonies established throughout the other continents. The entire population was separated into 10 tribes and followed one government and one spirituality. He said that the continent was located in the Pacific Ocean and was 5,000 miles east to west and 3,000 miles from north to south. He also stated that it had massive plains, vast rivers, rolling hills, large bays and estuaries, and that eventually it was obliterated in almost a single night after a series of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. After Mu sank, its inhabitants would become the founders of the great civilizations of Egypt, Central America, India, and others, and was the source of the world's ancient megalithic architecture. According to James, the king of Mu was named Ra, and he said this was related to the Egyptian god Ra, as well as the Rapa Nui word for the sun, Ra'a. Looking to the Bible, James also made a note that Moses had trained by the Nikal Brotherhood in Egypt, and he believed that the Assyrians mistranslated the Garden of Eden story, suggesting that it should have been in the Pacific Ocean. Today, most archeologists insist that the legends of Mu are pure pseudo-archeology, span end of story. But what I find interesting about this is that at the very least, there's some evidence that appears to support the idea. Let's begin with the geography. Now, the legends of Mu suggest that it was a massive continent in the Pacific Ocean. And there are a few accounts as to what this place looked like, while James suggested it was a long continent with rolling hills and many rivers, Drumfellow's account in the Flower of Life book suggested it was not a single island, but a stretch of islands of varying sizes, a massive archipelago ranging from the area around Hawaii through Polynesia and all the way to Easter Island. In floor maps of the Pacific Ocean, you can see this stretch of mountainous bodies underwater, which could have had both massive islands as well as supporting many little islands as well, were it at the surface of the ocean. There are several other ancient discoveries which could potentially be physical evidence of Mu, from Japan's underwater site at Yonaguni to the cryptic petroglyphs on Hawaii. And that's not to mention Easter Island. We know today that many of the remarkable features of Easter Island, such as the legendary Easter Island heads, which were recently discovered to have traces of full bodies, were only built in the last thousand years. But Easter Island also has an ancient written text in a language called Rongo Rongo, although it's unclear as to whether or not this is writing or proto-writing. If it is in fact a full writing system, it could be one of the only surviving cases of an independent invention of an alphabet ever in history. These surviving tablets are a huge mystery for us today, as the language has still not been deciphered. When we put these findings together, it seems to indicate higher levels of advancement in ancient cultures than we currently understand which is made even more interesting because of the remote location seemingly in the middle of nowhere. Looking to the Rapa Nui people of Easter Island, we actually find a similar story to the legends of Mu. In one of their creation myths, we find a story of a great and beautiful continent that they called Hiva. One night, the King of Hiva received a message in a dream that his land would sink. And sure enough, this vision came to pass. Thanks to the King and his dream, however, the people were guided to a new land which was Easter Island, and there they survived the disappearance of their homeland. Historical and scientific investigations on the people of Easter Island suggest that Polynesians from the Marquesas Islands traveled from the West to their new home, but the date is unknown with estimates for their arrival ranging anywhere between 300 to 1200 AD, perhaps even further back given the lack of evidence. This seems to show that the myth of Easter Island has more historical truth to it than mere fable. They did in fact migrate to Easter Island and one wonders what other parts of the myth may also prove to be true. Stepping back to the history of the people of Mu, in the ancient secret of the flower of life, Drumfellow described that the descendants of Adam and Eve were taken by Enki to Mu, although he used the name Lemuria, 
so that they could safely grow and develop their consciousness on their own without interference from the slave miners or the Anunnaki who were still mining Africa for its gold and inhabiting their cities and temples across the Middle East. There are a few different theories regarding the timeline of Mu. Some theories place Mu's existence from about 75,000 years ago to 30,000 years ago. And it was at that time that it sank and Atlantis rose. Others believe that Lemuria and Atlantis existed at the same time, which is what we find in James Churchward's version of the story. In Drumvalo's telling, on Mu, humans evolved to a very high level of consciousness, where we became capable of doing things that would seem almost impossible to us today. Supposedly, we experienced a reality where matter was less dense and more permeable to our thoughts and feelings. And so we were able to levitate, move through solid objects and other amazing feats. In a way, we were kind of like young deities. He also wrote that on this continent, the first mystery school was created. It was founded by two people who discovered the gift of immortality, who then taught this ability to approximately a thousand others before the time came when Mu sank. This event is described as a terrifying cataclysm, which we find two predominant versions for depending on the timeline. James Churchward suggested that the main mineral of the landmass of Mu was granite and was honeycombed with huge shallow chambers and cavities filled with explosive gases. And due to volcanic activity underneath the continent, it released tremendous explosions causing the continent to sink. As with most legends of a lost civilization, the stories all describe that Mu or Lemuria, for one reason or another, sank beneath the waves, leaving no remnant of it behind. And the survivors made their way to new homes. And one common theory about where they went was a new continent called Atlantis. Sort of a fun side note here. Do you remember way back in the original human history movie where we started by saying, well, this? This story spans back hundreds of thousands of years into our past. It talks about Tiamat and Nibiru, the Nephilim, seeding the human race, Adam and Eve, and the children of Lemuria. This portion of the story is really interesting, but not the most crucial to know. We're not going to be covering this at this time. We are, however, going to be picking up the story at the end of Lemuria and discussing the events of Atlantis up to present day. Well, guess what? We're here. I'm so happy to at long last bring some context to the beginning of that particular story. However, there's still more to cover that we previously hadn't. And for those who haven't seen the original human history movie yet, we'll make sure to cover the basics as well so that you won't be left out. Though, you can always go watch that one right after this is done. It was at this point that another mass migration occurred where the children of Mu found a new home and they called it Atlantis. So Atlantis, the best place to start here is with the origins of this myth. The first account of Atlantis actually came from Plato in his writings called Timaeus and Critias from about 360 BC. He discussed an ancient kingdom called Atlantis located on an island in the Atlantic Ocean, somewhere beyond the Pillars of Hercules in the modern day Straits of Gibraltar. Today, the modern consensus around the story is that Atlantis is purely fictitious, a parable used for educational purposes or to glorify Athens in the eyes of Plato. And while most people believe this, there are those who suggest otherwise. It's rather interesting that Plato, who is the earliest surviving source for the story of Atlantis, uh, tells us that he got it from his uh, relative Solon, who in turn got it from the ancient Egyptians, and that they spoke of a time 9,000 years before the time of Solon. That's 9,600 BC, or 11,600 years before the present. Academics think that Plato made it all up. But if Plato made it all up, it's extraordinary that he chose that date and that time, around 12,000 years ago. Because that was absolutely at the peak of the meltdown of the last ice age, when there was indeed global flooding. The story of Atlantis tells the tale of a maturing humanity who had developed a civilization on a large island often believed to be in the Atlantic Ocean. In the Flower of Life books, Drumvalo shares this image of Atlantis a rough generalization of what it might've looked like. We also find this diagram inside the book of the Emerald Tablets, of which we'll be looking at shortly. But with that said, it's been widely theorized that if there is an ancient lost civilization, it's most likely hidden somewhere under the ice in Antarctica. In a Nova special called Antarctica, Secrets Beneath the Ice, geologists discover multiple places in Antarctica, which had the remains of old mosses and plant tissues in what they described as pristine condition 
from a time when Antarctica was still warm and abundant with life. There are even pieces of trees that have been found, all of which have been preserved under permafrost rather than becoming fossilized. The geologists in this video describe that the bits of nature are not from millions of years ago, but relatively recent history. This is a landmark and paradigm shattering discovery because even today, if you do some research, you'll find that the general consensus is that Antarctica was last ice-free 3.5 million years ago. And the remnants that were just discovered there prove that number wrong entirely. This dramatically changes our perspective of the history of our world. Fragments of nature are found under a layer of volcanic ash, suggesting that a huge volcano or cataclysm of some kind, maybe a comet hitting the earth, caused a dramatic shift that we're now seeing the remnants of today. Further, I'd like to take a moment to discuss with you the legendary Piri Reis map, an old map drawn by Admiral and cartographer Piri Reis in Constantinople in 1513, which describes with remarkable geographical detail the seismic profile of certain portions of Antarctica. Reis used information gathered from many explorers at the time but what's amazing about this map is that Rees could not have acquired his information about Antarctica from any contemporary explorers because this continent remained undiscovered until nearly 300 years after the map was drawn. But what's perhaps even more anomalous about this whole thing is that the map depicts what Antarctica looks like under ice-free conditions. The last time that that area would have been free of ice would have been at least 6,000 BC which was a whole millennium before the Sumerian civilization really began to emerge into the culture we know today. A note on the southernmost section of the map reads, and in this country, it seems that there are white haired monsters in this shape and also six horned oxen. The Portuguese infidels have written it in their maps. Interestingly, the Portuguese provided information on this southernmost region in Reese's map, according to the notes on it. Now, Piri Reese himself left notes that his map was drawn from pre-existing information and maps. However, he himself did not venture any suggestions as to the identity of the cartographers who produced these earlier maps. In 1963, however, Professor Hapgood proposed a novel and thought-provoking solution to the problem. He argued that some of the source maps the Admiral had made use of, in particular the ones that were said to date back to the fourth century BC, had themselves been based on even older sources, which in turn had been based on sources originating in the furthest of antiquity. There was, he asserted, irrefutable evidence that the earth had been comprehensively mapped before 4000 BC by a hitherto unknown and undiscovered civilization, which had achieved a high level of technological advancement. The Piri Reis anomaly and the mysteries of Antarctica are described with significant detail in Graham Hancock's book, Fingerprints of the Gods, and we highly recommend giving it a read along with his follow-up book, Magicians of the Gods. Now, before we move on, there's just a few more interesting things that I have to share with you about Antarctica. The first is a particularly curious accidental leak of information that supports this idea that something is going on down there. And it actually comes from Fitbit. You see, recently Fitbit published a world heat map with Strava to show where people are commonly wearing their Fitbits. Now, I suppose most people do not disable their location services, because this published map at first showed a number of curious formations under the ice in Antarctica, including a large ring and some other underground bases. Since this was initially published, the government or whoever has forced Fitbit to remove these images from their public heat map, but you can still find a few YouTube videos of people pointing them out. Well, hey, like this one. Finally, in the last several years, photos that were taken using Google Earth were publicized causing more than a few heads to turn. Here is one that shows a rather curious formation that is clearly not natural to the environment. And here is one that looks more than a little bit like a pyramid. Many were quick to suggest that this was a remnant of some Atlantean civilization, but many critics were quick to put forth that it was just a four-sided mountain and that pyramid-shaped peaks are very common, such as the Matterhorn in the Alps and Mount Bullenstinder in Iceland as notable examples. And while there's no question that these are mighty mountains, this one in Antarctica is significantly cleaner. There's just no comparison really. It's much less rigid than any of the examples the skeptics give to try and debunk it. But look, it might just be a convenient mountain. We don't claim to know either way, but it's interesting to look at and ponder, wouldn't you agree? 
Now, along with all of these ancient discoveries and the revelation of our distant past, there is also the conversation of the Richat structure, sometimes called the Eye of the Sahara or Heart of Feathers in Arabic, which is commonly believed by many today to be a remnant of Atlantis. There's actually some pretty strange coincidences about it that have led many people today to assume the connection. You see, in his writings, Plato explained that the central city of Atlantis was sectioned into three rings, each with a large moat of water between them. And this is what draws many people to believe the Richat structure to actually be Atlantean remnants. For as we look at it from space, it really does appear almost exactly like Plato's account. But there's a little bit more to the theory than just looking similar. In a nutshell, according to Plato, the first king of Atlantis was known as Atlas, who divided his kingdom among his brothers and eventually created the vast empire that occupied much of the known world. But get this, according to the legends of the Berber people, who today live in Northwest Africa, they also have a mythical founder king who, you guessed it, was also called Atlas. Granted, there's not much to suggest they are the same person, and even Atlas of Mauritania is partly folklore, but according to reconstructed maps based on Herodotus's writings a while before Plato, some say he placed Atlantis in the same region right below the Atlas Mountains in Morocco. Now, it's worth pointing out that C14 dating places the Eye of the Sahara between 400 and 40 million years old. So it's way older than anything we've come across so far. And current research suggests that it's just one of those weird geological changes brought about by the separation of Pangaea. But what if it actually was an even older remnant of Atlantis? If we look back to Plato's account, he actually gives us some pretty good descriptions of what the environment and surroundings of Atlantis looked like. He tells us that the islands were larger than ancient Libya and Asia Minor combined, although this may be speaking to its power level and that the Egyptians described Atlantis as an island consisting mostly of mountains in the north and a huge plain in the south. He also says that the Atlanteans dug a great canal to the sea and alongside the bridges carved tunnels into the rings of rock so that ships could pass into the city. Now, if we look at the Richat structure, we can see that it has an opening, canal-shaped shaft to the south, which matches Atlantis's description of connecting to the sea. Further, a 2011 study seemed to indicate that carbonate within the breccia, bits of sedimentary rock, were created by low temperature hydrothermal waters. The eye also has mountains to the north, again, just like Plato said, which potentially have evidence of ancient rivers around them, as well as being situated on a huge open plain. Really, the surrounding mountain shapes and steep drops are uncanny resemblances to the description. What's more, geologically, the surrounding area is apparently full of red, black, and white colored stones, which Atlantis was said to have a lot of. Archaeologically speaking, the Richat has huge amounts of Archaeulean and pre-Archaeulean artifacts present along the northwest of the Outer Ring. It really is a mystery how these early Stone Age artifacts got here as neither recognizable midden deposits nor man-made structures have been recognized. But the current theory suggests that the area was either used for only short-term hunting and stone tool manufacturing, or the artifacts got diffused and moved there by different glacial cycles. Interestingly though, back in 2007, a number of unfossilized whale bones were found throughout Mauritania in the area surrounding the Richat structure, along with numerous assortments of shells indicating that at some point in recent geological history, the area was lower and closer to sea level. Finally, even the scientific explanation of the Richat, that it was formed by the molten rock pushing its way to the surface and then collapsing, going through multiple periods of being forced up and down, seems strangely reminiscent of Plato saying that Atlantis was destroyed by earthquakes. All this said, it is just a theory for if this really was Atlantis, it pushes our dating back from 13,000 years to over 40 million and calls into question the other ideas concerning Antarctica and even North America. But it's still very interesting to think about nonetheless. Now let's return to the story because there are several more accounts of Atlantis that we have to consider. One is the original story we first shared in the Hidden Human History movie regarding the Martians and the fall of consciousness. Then we have another version that comes from the Book of Enoch, an ancient text that accounts for some specific events that took place before the flood as well. We also see the Emerald Tablets and what is written there about the fall of Atlantis. 
Because we've already made a movie about the Atlantis Martian story, we'll just cover it briefly here. And for the sake of the story and the visualization of it, for now, we're just going to show Atlantis as we have so far, as a continent of its own. But keep in mind that this is kind of a placeholder as Atlantis is a great mystery. Even the name Atlantis comes from later writings about this land. And if we were to go back in time and discover that it was real, it most likely was not called Atlantis in their own language. Who knows, did the continent really sink? Was it Antarctica? Maybe instead of sinking, it flooded over and then froze underneath miles of ice. Or did it simply never exist at all? Well, if it did, here's a breakdown of one of the more popular stories about the legends of Atlantis. Essentially, the Atlanteans were more mature and evolved since their time on Mu and were very connected with each other and nature. But things changed dramatically for the Atlanteans when a different species from another world came to our planet. The story suggests that they were beings from Mars who were said to be responsible for destroying the atmosphere on the planet, causing it to become the red lifeless rock that we know it to be today. These beings had taken a path of separation in the evolution of their species, a path called the Lucifer experiment, which involves disconnecting themselves from each other and nature and having no inner love or compassion whatsoever. The story says that these Martians made a home for themselves on Atlantis and slowly began to affect the consciousness of the Atlanteans by introducing their technologies and affecting the way that the Atlanteans perceived reality. As a result, the Atlanteans began to become more disconnected from nature and each other, which allowed the Martians to easily take over. Eventually, a comet was said to have hit the planet right in the area where the Martians' home was on Atlantis. The Martians were furious, and so they built a technology called a synthetic Merkaba, and they were going to use it to get revenge. This technology, however, did not work properly and emitted a shockwave of energy on their home and ultimately created a dimensional tear. This caused a tremendous catastrophe for all of the life on Atlantis and the beings living there became very sick with consciousness and energy from other dimensions being pulled into their world. The result of this was a huge fall in consciousness, which coincided with a global pole shift, a geomagnetic reversal, a massive shift took place. Save for a few spiritual masters, all of humanity fell to a lower state of consciousness, as low as you can go and still survive. In the process of this, their memories were erased, just as a magnet can wipe the information on a hard drive. Now this may seem far-fetched, but it isn't impossible. One particular study provides good evidence that humans can perceive the magnetic field around them even as weak as the Earth's itself. A follow-up study found that the mechanism behind this are magnetized particles in the brain. Researchers concluded that for such an ability to exist, it must have had some evolutionary purpose. Interestingly, some studies have even indicated that two major geomagnetic shifts may have had an impact, not only on our evolution in the past, but also had a role in extinction events ranging from the early Quaternary period to the early Holocene. This study found that a large global geomagnetic reversal event called the Le Champ event 44,000 years ago and another unnamed event 13,000 years ago both coincided with mammal extinctions, which were impacted by a weakening of the Earth's magnetic field leading to higher ultraviolet radiation. This may not only coincide with the sinking of Atlantis, but also the theorized timeline of the sinking of Mu. Further, by comparing branches in the human family tree and linking them with the magnetic field information found in sediments and archaeomagnetic data, they found that there was possibly a long-term role for ultraviolet radiation and the magnetic field in human evolution. That said, the concept of memory erasure could have various meanings. In one sense, it could be a global magnetic effect wiping human memories but it could also relate to the destruction of all of our technology and most of civilization and being reduced to a level of consciousness where we had to start over technologically from scratch with no records and very little evidence of any ancient civilization. This entire story is said to have happened 13,000 years ago at the point when earth went through a huge shift pertaining to its polar ice caps when a massive amount of ice sheets began to melt, flooding the world with water and potentially helping to usher in the Holocene the epoch of time we are in today after the end of the last ice age. After this shift, small pockets of humans slowly began to develop and discover life all over again from square one. And the few spiritual masters who kept their memories began to support us as we became capable of comprehending their stories. They may have tried to explain the history of the world, but the fallen humans couldn't comprehend it. And so the stories were masked in the legends of the gods so that humanity could come to make sense of who they were and where they came from. 
These quote unquote gods seeded civilizations around the world from ancient Mesopotamia and Egypt to India and all the way to the Olmecs in Mesoamerica. Of course, it may be more logical to presume that it was Enki or the other Anunnaki who helped seed civilization once more, at least in ancient Sumer, or perhaps a combination of the two. Ultimately, this is the point at which a lot of this entire story would have been passed down to the Sumerians. Earlier on, we explored the possibility that the stories of the gods were an encoded message handed down to the Sumerians and Babylonians by these beings who had a much higher understanding than the early humans did. If this story is true, then this is how the Sumerians would have come to have knowledge of the origins of the solar system from previous higher beings who shared it with them. But is it truly possible that this is how it all happened? Now in this story, it was said that the goal for us as a species was to return to our original higher consciousness in as short of a time as possible. And the time that was forecasted for us to finally begin remembering who we are and what our place in the cosmos is, is this point in time right now which is why this conversation is more important than ever, for it would seem as though we are at a huge turning point for our species and actively shifting into a higher consciousness more and more each day. Interestingly, this shift in energy is currently being mirrored by the Schumann resonance in our Earth's magnetic fields. The electromagnetic resonance being generated by lightning discharge in a part of the upper atmosphere known as the ionosphere has been increasing recently to coincide with our frequency shift. This means that our magnetic field is actually changing to coincide with our evolution, which I find just to be amazing. This is a very exciting time in our evolution, as with research teams like the Global Coherence Initiative and HeartMath, some very interesting research is being done on the interconnection between humanity and Earth's magnetic fields and energetic systems, giving us insights into our own frequency changes as and when they happen. Anyway, back to Atlantis. As I was saying, there's a few other versions of how the story could have transpired. We're going to now briefly look at these other two accounts of Atlantis from ancient times. First, let us begin with the Emerald Tablets of Thoth the Atlantean. These are said to be 12 ancient tablets which are under the care of a secret society in Egypt who have vowed to protect the sacred wisdom inscribed upon them. The tablets are said to have been written by Thoth who presided on Atlantis before the fall and whose Atlantean name was Chikatet Arlek Vomalites. The tablets were supposedly translated by a man named Dr. Doriel. Of course, these tablets are believed by many to be a hoax for no modern picture of them actually exists and they're not on display in any museum. Critics of this work point out that Doriel seemed to write these tablets based on the occult theosophist society and other spiritual teachings and channelings along with a few ideas thrown in found within H.P. Lovecraft stories. And those connections do seem to be valid. Yet, even if the tablets themselves are not truly authentic, it would seem as though they are predominantly based upon a number of wisdom teachings. Doriel also provided a rich account of Atlantean culture, which could have been channeled, but of course, it's unclear if any of it is grounded in truth. For myself, I found a great deal of inspiration and wisdom by reading these passages, and they can be excellent tools for exploring the inner mysteries and contemplating the universe. Spirit Mysteries recently published a new edition of the Emerald Tablets, made to be easily legible to the modern reader, for the original publication is like, Hark now and hear ye, and thou thine own inner flame shall be lit. It can be a bit hard to follow, so you'll find links in the comments to go and get a free download today. The Emerald Tablets describe a number of different things from wisdom teachings to ancient history. In a nutshell, Thoth describes the beauty and majesty of Atlantis, a bright and vibrant home for the people who lived there. He goes on to describe the degeneration of the hearts of the Atlanteans, which led to their downfall and the great cataclysm. He said that Atlantis fell because there were those who were too proud of their knowledge and dared to enter the halls of Amenti in order to get greater knowledge, kind of a lust for power moment that created the cataclysm. This could be referring to the Martians building the synthetic Merkaba with forbidden powers. He also said that the few who survived did so by using a spaceship which today is buried beneath the Sphinx. This is a concept we explored much more thoroughly in the original human history movie. Throughout the Emerald Tablets, he also describes a great deal of wisdom which we can use to evolve our consciousness. We highly recommend you go and read these passages for yourself if you haven't. For now though, let's stay on the subject of history because we have one more account of this pre-flood period of time to look at. Now, the Book of Enoch is one of the most ancient religious texts we have available to us today, with influence extending into the New Testament, even despite it not being considered biblical canon. The text appears to date back to about 300 to 200 BCE, so we must establish that it is younger than the Sumerian texts. 
the Book of Enoch describes a story from the perspective of Enoch, who was the great grandfather of Noah, who lived for 365 years up until the great flood wiped out most of humanity. The story details accounts of the Nephilim and the Watchers. As we previously discussed, the Nephilim are described as the children of the Anunnaki and human women together. Since the Book of Enoch describes that the Nephilim were the offspring of the Watchers and human women, we can easily link the Watchers to being the same as the Anunnaki. It's for this reason the Book of Enoch is so valuable to us in deciphering our past, because it provides one of the few clear links between the ancient Sumerian tablets and the stories we find in the Bible today. But because this book concerns itself so heavily with the events of the Nephilim and the Anunnaki, or the Watchers, you can probably imagine why they decided to omit this from the biblical canon. Some believe that these giants may have been the reason for the Great Flood, as they were seen to be unnatural and harmful to the human race. In the Book of Enoch, it describes that these Nephilim, known also as giants, multiply in numbers and grow to the point that humanity can no longer provide enough resources for themselves. With food shortages, the giants then began consuming humans and other animals. The Book of Enoch also tells us that many of the watchers, such as Azazel specifically, were responsible for teaching humans the art of warfare and how to construct weapons and other harmful devices. And for the sake of correlation, this is also reflected in the Emerald Tablets speaking to the degeneration of the human consciousness. Now, the events of this book are rather long and we're not going to get into all the details right now, but the story essentially culminates in the Great Flood wiping out humanity with only a few surviving humans, which is where Noah and the Ark come in. As for Enoch himself, he is taken into heaven by God in a fiery chariot, which is believed in some circles to actually be describing a spaceship that took him away to live somewhere else, maybe on another planet. Now, as we bring this segment to a close, there is one more theory out there pertaining to our original story that I must share. According to Sitchin, you know how Marduk was related to a planet in the earlier stories? Well, in later Sumerian tellings, he also seems to act with very personal and human-like characteristics. And Sitchin believed that the name Marduk used to describe a planet in some texts was also used to describe a specific being, just like Enki. He believed that Marduk was stationed on Mars at one point, but came to Earth to invoke his authority and rulership over the world. This may even correlate to the Martian theory we covered before. This might be just a fanciful long shot, but is it possible that all of these stories connect and Atlantis fell because the Martians were actually a specific group of Anunnaki led by Marduk who came to the Earth and bred with human women creating deformed people and caused certain groups of humans to pursue dark magic, effectively changing the evolution of humanity, leading to this great cataclysm and fall in consciousness. Could it be? Obviously, all of this is just an idea. We cannot say definitively heads or tails what happened, but the connections here are definitely fun to explore nonetheless. How about you? What do you think happened? Make sure to let us know in the comments of this video. Now, this story is not over yet we still have at least one more massive anomaly we have to look at. The point in history when all of these stories line up with each other, the Great Flood. Speaking of stories of ancient floods, most of us are undoubtedly familiar with the legend of Noah's Ark, a story in the Bible which describes how at one point, an ark was built by Yahweh's chosen person, who in the Bible is known as Noah. However, the character of Noah was most definitely inspired by based on, or perhaps even translated from, a much older tradition of flood myths that had been in circulation for thousands of years before the writings of Genesis. If we look to older writings, we find very similar stories written about in at least three different versions from the Mesopotamians alone. These older Noahs are known as Ziasudra, Utnapishtim, and Atrahasis respectively, each being a part of their own story, expanding upon one another and giving us a fuller picture of the whole narrative. In the 19th century, a seriologist, George Smith, translated the first Babylonian account of the Great Flood, which sparked great interest in the topic, as many believed at the time that the text acted as external proof of the events of Genesis. Consequently, countless other so-called flood myths were unearthed and eventually translated. The most well-known of the flood myths of Mesopotamia are found in a few sources. The Akkadian Atrahasis epic from 1800 BC, the Eridu Genesis and the Sumerian King Lists, featuring Ziasudra as the last human king before the deluge. And finally, the Epic of Gilgamesh around 700 BC, featuring Utnapishtim, 
which is largely regarded as being the closest in structure to our story of Noah in Genesis. Now, each tale is slightly different, given that each writer wanted to emphasize different aspects of the stories, but the overall narrative is mostly the same. In the Epic of Ziosudra, we begin with the creation of the world and humans, but the middle section is unfortunately lost, with the final fragment telling us that the gods have decided to destroy the world. In this version, we don't know why the flood is being sent, but Enki proceeds to warn Ziasudra to build an ark to help survive the deluge. In the later Epic of Gilgamesh, we learn that the Anuna Enlil sent the storms because humans had become too noisy, which could be speaking to humanity growing out of control. In this rendition of the tale, the Noah character, Utnapishtim, is then tasked by Enki to abandon his worldly possessions and create a giant ship to be called a preserver of life. It's very interesting then to see how much earlier established myths and even gods were incorporated into the narrative of the Old Testament under the guise of Yahweh or Adonai. In each of the ancient tellings, the Ark Builder was tasked with bringing his wife, family and relatives along with the craftsmen of his village, baby animals and grains because a great flood was coming and would wipe out all of the life that was not on the ship. What's particularly interesting to us concerning this flood myth is that a great deal of historical and geological information shows us that this was an actual event which possibly took place between roughly 13,000 and 8,000 years ago, when the ice caps rapidly began to melt and flood the earth, wiping out a great deal of life and drastically changing the landscape. We can actually see this in our history today. Even a quote from Live Science states, about 13,000 years ago, more than three fourths of the large ice age animals, including woolly mammoths, mastodons, saber toothed tigers, and giant bears died out. Scientists have debated for years over the cause of the extinction with both of the major hypotheses, human overhunting and climate change being insufficient to account for the mega die off. That said, there is still considerable debate over when a deluge event occurred. Excavations in Iraq have revealed evidence of localized flooding at Churupak and various other Sumerian cities. A lot of other Sumerian cities display evidence of flooding on a large scale, but they are all from different periods. Modern consensus argues that flooding in the wake of the last glacial maximum are what inspired the ancient flood myths around the world, with the geography of Mesopotamia being drastically changed by the filling of the Persian Gulf after sea waters rose following the last glacial period. Some authors have even postulated that stories of a great cataclysm were ancient cultures' ways of explaining the early Bronze Age collapse and transition to more urbanized societies around 2900 BC. If these texts and stories are to be believed, this was potentially the event which wiped out all of the slave humans who, up till this point, according to Sitchin, had still been mining gold or slaving away at other tasks which the Anunnaki commanded. It was during this shift that the Anunnaki retreated from their earthly settlements, with Enki's last act being to support humanity and help us to survive the flood and shift in consciousness so that we could resettle and begin inhabiting the earth, this time without being isolated to any particular area, free to roam and inhabit the earth as we desired. It is believed that about 6,000 years later, they delivered information and wisdom of their existence to humanity through a messenger, seeding ancient Sumer with knowledge of their species and human origins. Curiously, the legend of a massive flood is actually not exclusive to Middle Eastern mythologies, but in fact is written about all over the world in countless different ideologies and cultures. In China, we see a story of a great flood that supposedly lasted for two generations, wiping out everyone save for those who moved to live in the mountains. In Central and South America, there are a number of ancient myths of floods wiping out almost all of the people, save for a scarce few who repopulate the earth. And as we looked at, there are even several stories across Mesopotamia, which all share a similar common thread. We actually don't have enough time in this singular video to explore all of the flood myths of the world because we would probably be here for hours just on that one topic alone. Generally, in most of the flood stories, it is the gods or a specific God who brings the flood to wipe out humanity, either to start over or because we have displeased them somehow. For those interested in really diving into the various accounts, however, Graham Hancock has explored the world flood myths to an exceptional detail in his book, Fingerprints of the Gods, which again, we highly recommend reading. And speaking to this, there is an even more prevalent theory that brings all of these stories together and describes similar global events in history 
when the ice caps melted and the water rose tremendously, wiping out all or most of life. Geologists agree that by 8,000 BC, the great Wisconsin and worm ice caps had retreated. The ice age was over. It has been postulated that the deluge myth in North America may be based on a sudden rise in sea levels caused by the rapid draining of prehistoric Lake Agassiz at the end of the last ice age, about 8,400 years ago. However, the 7,000 years prior to that date had witnessed climactic and geological turbulence on a scale that was almost unimaginable. The few scattered traces of surviving humans must have led lives of constant terror and confusion with periods of time filled with violent floods and climatic changes. The bulk of the animal extinctions took place between 11,000 and 9,000 BC when there were violent and unexplained fluctuations of climate, which geologist John Imbrie has called a climatic revolution. Now there is a very interesting theory about exactly how this whole thing took place and what it means for us today. To share this theory, we've borrowed a clip from our friends at Gaia from one of our favorite series, Ancient Civilizations, featuring Graham Hancock, Greg Braden, and a ton of other experts as they help to decipher the clues of the ancient past. What's especially remarkable about this theory is that it aligns very well with the story of Atlantis and an absolutely massive shift of ages featuring over 20 authors, which finds evidence for meteor or comet impacts on four different continents, North America, South America, Europe, and Western Asia from about 12,800 years ago in the form of nanodiamonds, spherules, and melt glass consistent with meteor impact. Randall Carlson is a PhD who incorporated the dating of Gobekli Tepe with geological evidence, which suggests global flooding. He wrote that if an impact actually hit and there was a cataclysm, you could easily see how an effect of that magnitude would destabilize the earth for perhaps a thousand years or so. It's after this window of time that the Younger Dryas geological records shows an abrupt change in climate that we date Gobekli Tepe. But you see, this is not where the expedition ends in the search for answers about the great flood. As Graham Hancock has also put forward even more information in his most recent book, America Before. His new work focused on various kinds of evidence from the Americas, mostly from the mound building cultures of the Mississippi River Valley and exploring the sacred geometry of the Amazonia, bringing to light some connections that seem to indicate that the occupation of the Americas was much earlier than is currently thought and even appears to share some common concepts in ideology to that of the ancient Egyptians. Now, before we go any further, we should point out that the occupation and colonization of the Americas is a hugely controversial topic and has been described as one of the most agitated, fierce, and fruitless debates in modern archeology. span In fact, there are sites such as the Bluefish Caves and the Old Crow Flats, which demonstrate human habitation in the Americas thousands of years before previously thought, and thus were met with fierce scrutiny. So it's no surprise that Hancock's work is often met with instant rejection. Now Graham theorizes that a precursor civilization, which he argues were found in the Americas, were wiped out by global flooding, and the survivors of which helped to seed later mythological stories. This idea is made even more interesting by the evidence of dramatic sea level rises during or just before the Younger Dryas. In a nutshell, around 12,900 years ago, the world was warming up from the last glacial maximum and becoming increasingly habitable when a comet entered our atmosphere and broke into several major fragments, many of which impacted the North American ice sheets. The tremendous impact of this comet hitting the earth would have caused a few key things to happen. First, we would have seen a large amount of freshwater flooding into the lower coastal lands and entering the oceans, disrupting the natural ocean currents and raising the sea levels. Second, we would have a tremendous amount of steam shooting into the atmosphere, along with smoke from any fragments that didn't land in ice and starting fires upon impact. All of this together would block out the sun for a very long time. And this causes a sudden drop in earth's temperatures. This is exactly what we see happen by climate graphs of that time period. This rapid drop followed by a thousand years later, the rising of Earth's climate. To date, no scientific or geological hypothesis comes close to answering the mystery of what caused the spike closer than the comet impact hypothesis. Graham even suggested that if this were to have happened, it's possible that parts of the giant ice sheets, these massive glaciers could have broken off from the main mass and slid across the Earth slowly. If this was to happen, it would have destroyed anything that it slid over, ultimately leaving us with no record or even ruin 
of any civilization that might've been there before. Now, this is where things get very interesting because while things line up very well with the impact hypothesis, there's also evidence that in the last thousand years leading up to this event, we also see a sudden shift in sea levels caused by something called meltwater pulses, where sea levels could rise up to 25 meters over the course of about 400 years. This long, slow and gradual event would have definitely brought people more inland for sure, but it would have taken some time to happen. The key difference here is that with the Younger Dryas ice sheet, we are seeing a sudden drop of temperatures in a very short amount of time in contrast. Seriously, today we are worried about a climate change of only a few degrees, but based on data from the Greenland ice sheet, the Younger Dryas period dropped about four to 10 degrees Celsius in the space of a few decades. There are alternative theories. However, the presence of the nano diamonds and impact sites really seem to indicate that the comet is the most likely outcome. Other theories include ideas such as the earth being hit by a solar flare, causing the ice sheets to begin melting, which still disrupted the ocean currents and subsequently caused the temperatures to drop as a result. And along with this, there's another theory that suggests mega meltwater avalanches that could be generated on the surface of a continental ice sheet and produce fast moving waves of water nearly 100 meters high, traveling at 900 kilometers an hour, crashing into the world and destroying everything in its path. Again, these are all theories, so make sure you do your own research if you really wanna go down that rabbit hole. Ultimately, all of these ideas, along with all of the data that we have from the Younger Dryas period, suggests that there was massive flooding and definitely would have been experienced by humans living at that time as catastrophic. Now, since research into all of this is still ongoing, there are still many mysteries to be revealed about this event. Naturally, with sea levels rising, the lower coastal lands are the first to be submerged and anyone living and hunting there would have been submerged with it, similar to how Doggerland was submerged around 6,200 BC in Europe. Any humans who survived such cataclysmic events would have had it ingrained in their cultural memory that would have been passed through oral tradition into later civilizations. If this event really happened, it most certainly would have contributed to the mass extinction events that we see in history and in extent paved the way for the host of flood myths on every continent. And the last thing I'd like to speak on concerning the Younger Dryas impact is this. Generally speaking, the Younger Dryas impact is believed to have taken place about 12,800 years ago, which returning to this chart shows us when we see this sudden and sharp drop in global climate. However, there's very little conversation about what this other spike is known geologically as the bowling Alarod period, which takes place just before. It's true that when we look at the last thousand years before the Younger Dryas, we see phenomenal climate changes as well, but there is very little evidence about what caused it. And most theories about how this could have been caused are problematic or inconclusive. The standing theory at the moment is that warm ocean currents deep in the North Atlantic abruptly released into the colder water above it, warming the waters and causing ice sheets to break off from the glaciers. While this is the prevalent theory, many others simply remark that it's just climate change, which seems to be another way of saying, well, we don't quite know for sure. Yet, if this is just a result of natural climate cycles, then that certainly brings about a much different perspective on climate change today. So that said, we have a few ideas about this on our own because to us, this looks like a connected event. It looks like the earth may have been going through some natural warming on its own, but that something caused temperatures to spike up and then suddenly drop. This may indicate that the comet impact is a little bit older than believed, that the first spike was actually the comet impact and then the drop was the result of enough meltwater flooding the oceans for so long that it disrupted the ocean currents and we see the temperatures go down as we discussed. Another possibility is that the first spike was the solar flare that we explored previously, which may have triggered a radical lifting of the earth's temperatures, causing the ice to melt, flooding the oceans and disrupting the currents. If this is true, then perhaps a comet is not necessary in the equation. However, it's worth mentioning that the nano diamonds seem to indicate that there was a comet in earth's recent history. It's possible that there are other causes of such a spike too. If we look to ancient India, we find stories of the Astra or the Brahmastra super weapons. However, before we can explore and discuss these super weapons or where they fit into our ancient past, we must return to the subject of Gobekli Tepe. This site is compelling archeological evidence that now dates human civilization back to nearly 12,000 years ago, around roughly 9,000 BCE. What puzzles archeologists and historians alike was the previous assumption that stratified and complex civilizations did not emerge until around the time of Sumer, about 7,000 years ago. Until then, all we have evidence of in the timeline are semi-nomadic pastoralists 
who would follow hunted game around seasonally, perhaps occasionally using tools. Instances of monumental architecture are extremely rare, even though we have cases such as Cahokia in the Mississippi River Valley and a supposed city of hunter gatherers. The general consensus is a distinct lack of the social organization required to build and maintain complex ritual sites. Even more interestingly, the timeline arguably lines up with a certain theory about the date of the construction of the Sphinx in ancient Egypt. Robert Schock is responsible for identifying what he believes are wear patterns on the Sphinx that he has labeled as water erosion. But there were no great storms in ancient Egypt four or 5,000 years ago. But if you go back 12,000 years ago, there was heavy rainfall in that region where in the Holocene, the region was much greener and wetter than it is now. Now the Sphinx erosion theory was met with great skepticism. Dr. Zahi Hawass, head of the Egyptian Board of Antiquities said at the time, of course it is not possible for one reason. No single artifact, no single inscription or pottery or anything has been found until now in any place to predate the Egyptian civilization more than 5,000 years ago. This was a common belief back then since the earliest signs of megalithic construction were only 5,000 years old. But the discovery and dating of Gobekli Tepe proves that structures were being built around 12,000 years ago in one form or another. While a lot of work has been done to try and disprove the Sphinx water theory, such as limestone analysis and contextual orientation, what if there really was something even more ancient about the Sphinx? The Sphinx has fascinated people since Cleopatra's times. There are inscriptions from as far back as Ptolemaic Egypt of excavations unearthing the Sphinx in the search for hidden passages. And even today, the mystery of the Sphinx persists. We have no idea what it is, what it's for. And there is nothing we have found that's like the Sphinx at Giza. Who built it? Why? How? Mainstream academics believe it was built in the time of Khafre, based on the likeness of the head and similarity of the temple of the Sphinx, but other anomalies persist. The most basic mystery regarding the Sphinx is how it's missing from the Egyptian records. Egyptians loved to write hieroglyphs, we have writings talking about the purchasing of materials and construction of pyramids, divorce records. There's even a record about how one day there was a woman disgruntled by a piece of bread who tried to fight the traitor. Seriously, meticulous records, including records for all of the temples. Yet no records exist from ancient Egypt about the building of the Sphinx. They just don't exist. Not a single word about it in the written records. One thing we do know from an inscription on the ancient Egyptian artifact, the dream speller, is that the Pharaoh Khafre, who today many believe built the Sphinx, claims that he himself discovered the Sphinx buried in the sand and had his temple built around it. Not only that, but the Sphinx also lines up with the sun for the spring equinox and the constellation housing the sun circa 5,000 years ago is Taurus, but 9,000 BC or 11,000 years ago, we see Leo in the sky, which may be another clue as to when the Sphinx was actually built. Despite the discovery of Gobekli Tepe, Robert Schock's erosion hypothesis and the constellation alignment, not to mention with the Sphinx's construction missing from the records, many modern scientists remain skeptical and critical of these arguments. While we will admit, if it was just one anomaly, maybe it would seem like a pretty crazy idea. But when you put all of the anomalies together, they do seem to add up. All of the evidence we have explored was known about before Gobekli Tepe was discovered. But most scientists argued that it was preposterous since no other megalithic sites were made this far back. But thanks to the discovery of Gobekli Tepe, the idea that the Sphinx is older than we thought is starting to be thought about more often. The construction of Gobekli Tepe would then be attributed to survivors of the catastrophe who passed on their advanced knowledge to human tribes set back from the massive natural disaster. This is especially made curious by the legendary carvings of the handbags of the gods. You see, all over the world, we find these images of gods holding what looks like a bag. And there is a carving from Gobekli Tepe featured on pillar 43, known as the vulture pillar, dating nearly to 9,000 BCE, which shows a similar handbag-like image. It has left many to ponder their connection. And some even believe that the handbag is a sign of the gods bestowing the seeds of knowledge of civilization to humanity. What's more amazing is that Gobekli Tepe is located at the south of Turkey, inside of the Fertile Crescent the place where agriculture is believed to have been invented 10,000 years ago. Could those handbags be a clue to bridging the gap between a lost civilization and the world we have today? Gobekli Tepe raises a lot of questions to the established history and archeology span of the time. 
The great extinction, evidence of flooding, great climate change and structures way ahead of their time all seem to be pointing to a single earth shaking event around 12,000 years ago. And its time of origin lines up with many significant events and mysteries present in our timeline so far. For many scholars, the uncovering of this 12,000 year old structure corroborated theories and hypotheses that were once considered fringe or conspiratorial. Now, when we're looking at the story of our ancient past and the stories of old, there's one more area that must be explored and it must be done with caution, the Hindu scriptures. Now, the most famous in new age circles is the Bhagavad Gita, which is a huge topic all on its own. It's over 700 verses long and is just a small part of the enormous Mahabharata epic. It's actually only part of book six of the epic, which has over 18 books, yet is an aspect of this particular conversation about ancient civilizations that a lot of people talk about today. The Bhagavad Gita is set in the frame of a conversation between one of the Pandava princes, a guy named Arjuna and his guide, the God Krishna. As it opens, it covers something known as the Dharma Yudha, which translates roughly as the righteous war from Sanskrit. The story begins with Arjuna, who is afraid of what the coming war will do to his people and afraid of how much suffering it will cause. He wonders if he should renounce and seeks Krishna's counsel, who shows up and says, don't worry, kid, you're the best around. And then whose discourse constitutes the majority of the story. The conversations cover a broad range of spiritual topics, touching upon ethical dilemmas and philosophical issues that go far beyond the war Arjuna faces and into profound spiritual teachings. Krishna is basically described as the first motivational speaker in human history. From scholarly points of view, the nature and meaning of the text has been strongly debated with most researchers and translators arguing that it constitutes allegory or metaphorical tales to illustrate philosophical concepts. Some scholars have also argued that it portrays varying relations between the personal soul, the Atman, and the universal soul, Brahman, and the Advaita Vedanta school arguing that the core tenet is speaking to non-dualism, that all souls are part of the same whole. Alternatively, some schools see dualism as the primary lesson or that the souls of all of the characters are both different and the same all in one. So if you haven't guessed, academic study of this text is very complex and there's quite a lot of debate and confusion around the true meaning of the text. For the most part, the setting of the Gita in a battlefield has been interpreted as an allegory for the ethical and moral struggles of human life. However, there are some who believe that the story itself is actually describing an actual account of a real life war in history. And of course, real life weapons. This view of the Mahabharata as a literal event is something purported by many ancient astronaut theorists. And as we personally dove into the subject, we found it to be a little bit sketchy. There were a lot of claims such as ancient nuclear weapon radiation and other quotes from the Gita supporting the theory that then didn't actually exist. The whole thing is likely just a consequence of really bad translations, misunderstandings of the original text, and maybe even a little bit of deception for the sake of content creation. So for anyone who wants to get the full story on the claims about this, we'll share a special blog post in the comments below all about it. However, there are a few aspects of this, which is interesting to explore due to mythological similarities to the stories we've been exploring so far. It's just important to know that there doesn't appear to be much in the way of historical or physical evidence for these events. One of the most curious aspects of the Hindu mythologies was the Brahmastra created by the God Brahma, which is described as an iron bolt through which all the individuals in the race of the Vrishnis and the Andakas became consumed into ashes, a fierce iron bolt that looked like a gigantic messenger of death. Interestingly, once King Ugrasena witnessed what the weapon could do, he took the decision to reduce it to a fine powder to protect the future generations to avoid temptation. I don't know about you, but this almost sounds like a description of the Thunderbolts theory of the massive column of lightning that descended from one planet and crashed down to the earth. The only main difference here is that the story seems to indicate it was a purposeful weapon and not a discharge from a planet. The other synchronicity from the Hindu texts includes the presence of something called Vimanas, which are said to be flying palaces or chariots that are very common in a number of stories. The mythology here raises interesting questions due to its similarities to other tales from around the world. Could the stories of the Anunnaki and their ships be related in some way to the flying chariots of the Hindu gods? It's not actually as crazy as it sounds that early Indus River Valley civilization and Mesopotamia had cultural links, stretching as far back as 9,000 to 6,500 BC, indirect contact seems to have occurred as the consequence of the Neolithic revolution and the spread of agriculture after 9,000 BCE. 
The prehistoric agriculture of South Asia is thought to have combined local resources like cattle with farming resources from the Near East as a first step around 8,000 BCE. At the site of Murgar in Pakistan around 7,000 BCE, full sets of Near Eastern agricultural products can be found, stuff like wheat and barley, as well as goats, sheep, and cattle. Later on, trade kind of exploded between the two regions with stuff like clove heads from the Moluccas being found at Tel Ashara, different kinds of shells and beads being found at various sites around 2500 BCE, and of course, lavishly decorated cylinder seals depicting mythological scenes or animals. The bottom line is, with trade happening pretty consistently until the Indus civilization collapsed, it's almost common sense to acknowledge that cultural ideas and mythologies also got exchanged. In this, even the real mythologies themselves are fascinating and have tons of curious connections throughout without needing to elaborate on them. If there's any grain of truth to these stories at all, then it adds credence to the idea that at one point, perhaps there were advanced civilizations with incredible technologies in our ancient past. Now, looking at our story regarding the fall of Atlantis and the influence of these other beings in the Mesopotamian accounts, it appears that countless cultures have been influenced by these Near Eastern schools of thought, from the Persians to the Greeks. And even much later, it appears as though the Judeo-Christian religions all seem to stem from each other like branches of a tree. But what about the people across the rest of the world? In this historical theory, it suggests that there were still civilizations existing elsewhere on the earth at the time of the fall. Because when the inhabitants of Mu left their home, not all of them went to Atlantis. Some moved to the continents we call the Americas and others went to Asia. This would make sense considering Mu would have been directly between those two in the Pacific Ocean. With this idea, we see this theory begin to explain how different spiritualities developed in different regions of the world. The Lemurians who did not migrate to Atlantis would not have had the same experiences that the Atlanteans did with the fall. And if the stories are true, neither would they have become more left brain thinkers. And so after the fall, their spiritualities would have developed based on their environments and any supportive influence from those who made it through with their memories intact. When we observe the world's religions today, there are really three main forms that we can identify. Firstly, we have the Western faiths, which are generally the Abrahamic ones, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, but which relate with the Greek, Persian, and Egyptian mystery schools from thousands of years prior. Next, we have the Eastern spiritualities like Taoism, Buddhism, Shinto, and so on, which are more to do with connecting with the spirit of nature or going deep within yourself to cultivate inner peace and stillness. Generally, these paths are less seen as religions, but ways of life and traditions to create harmony in one's life. The last faith group are the indigenous spiritualities, which are usually shamanic and animistic in nature and are often developed around connecting with the spirit of the planet and nature in an intimate relationship to aid in spiritual, emotional, and even physical healing. Now, we understand that there is an incredibly massive number of spiritualities on this planet, and I'm not trying to oversimplify or generalize the diversity here. For so many of these faiths are unique unto themselves and beautiful in what they are and represent. Nevertheless, we can see this pattern of location and influence across time in how these different faith groups emerged, bringing us to where we are today it would make sense that the Sumerian mythologies and subsequent Abrahamic faiths are concerned with the stories of the gods from the past so much, especially if there were enlightened beings who provided them with these stories in the first place. However, one of the earliest groups to suggest this independent racist theory were the Theosophist Society of Madame Helena Blavatsky in the late 1800s. In her work, The Secret Doctrine, she proposes a theory that five to six different root races spread out across the globe and settled in different regions as the earth changed throughout history. Of course, much of their information was apparently gleaned through astral clairvoyance and channeling, as well as discussing the older works of the Platonic philosophers. So take what is said here on your own merit. According to Blavatsky's writings, there will be seven root races assembled for our earth and each root race is divided into seven sub races, but only five root races have appeared so far with the sixth being expected to emerge in the 28th century. Francis Bacon, whom Theosophy considers to be the legendary Count of St. Germain, in his work, The New Atlantis, describes a potential future civilization which lives on a land called Ben Salem. Following their work, the first race were known as the Polarians. These were beings composed entirely of etheric matter and had no physical bodies. They were some of the oldest beings to inhabit our planet and lived during the early stages of our world when it was still cooling on the legendary Mount Meru from Eastern mythologies. The second race lived in what is often called Hyperborea by the Greeks and Romans. 
In modern day, this is suggested to be the Northern territories such as Greenland, Iceland, Canada, and Scandinavia. Due to their climate, this race developed different skin tones and a focus around surviving in the cold weather. The third and fourth races were the Lemurians and the Atlanteans that we have spoken about already. The fifth race were the Aryans. This was the current epoch that Blavatsky believed us to be in, which in her opinion were descended from and the result of the spread of Lemurians and Atlanteans after the sinking of their home. However, the concept of Aryans were distorted and diluted by Hitler and his whole Aryan race thing, but it's interesting nonetheless to visualize the history of the world in this way, almost as if descending from a higher frequency into this postmodern world we live in. We found all of this to be an interesting exploration of the history of humanity, and one that bridges quite well in the exploring of the epochs of time and the fall of Atlantis, bringing us to today. All of this really goes to show that these world religions are fundamentally connected with each other and a part of a much bigger story. Spiritual value can often be found in any faith if we look for it. And it's not appropriate to claim that only one religion or spirituality is specifically better or worse than another. Well, unless its core tenets are like, you know, hurt others, take advantage of people or kill people you don't like. Rather, today we simply must learn that we are all connected, all a part of the same family, and that we shouldn't demonize each other for our various beliefs, but hold a space of love and compassion for each other and what we believe, even if we disagree. Ultimately, this is a story about a young species who is struggling to find itself. We are learning the nature about who we are and recognizing that there might be a lot more to our origins than what we have been led to believe so far. And as fate would have it, there was an event that took place in history that dramatically changed the course of our history and shaped our world to be what it is today. If you want to continue... After the Great Flood, it was a long time until the emergence of what today we know as the first civilization. As if out of nowhere, the Sumerians came into existence and from there, the Egyptians followed shortly thereafter. Over the preceding several thousand years, human civilization would change and evolve, all looking back and honoring the gods that started it all. How did we go from Atlantis to the world we have today? Find out on the next episode of the Sumerian Epic, The Rebirth of Culture.